Hello everybody, this is Fernando for the latest Cryptids and Monsters video. Alright, let's go ahead and let's do the next part of Chapter 1 of the Occult Investigator Real Cases from the Files of X Investigations book by Bob Johnson. This will be Part 3 of this chapter. I'll include the link below in case if you wanted to read the book for free for yourself. That way you get to enjoy all those other chapters as is. And I'll share this part here and then give my own thoughts and opinions on it afterward. Things are still going good, so I'm glad to see that people have some interest in this. I'm certainly looking forward to some of the other parts as well. So let's go ahead and let's share part three which is titled The Birth of an X Investigations. So here it is. My conversation about creating a special unit to concentrate on the paranormal and occult in Vincent's detective agency to this point was mainly a friendly discussion and a fact-finding mission on his part to determine if there really was anything to my idea. We kicked around the possibilities, often returning to the problem of whether people would think they... Vincent and his business were a bit loony, but there was no solid commitment, much less an invitation from Vin Vincent to provide some proof that this kind of business could succeed. But all that changed after my Salem excursion. I was now confident that when I returned to New York from my ghost hunting adventures with bona fide digital evidence of a real ghost sighting, Vincent would be a lot more receptive and a lot less skeptical. What I didn't bargain for was that when I got back to my Manhattan apartment, I would find the message on my telephone answering machine from a woman at Vincent's office who identified herself only as Silvana, saying that she was working with Vincent on a special case that involved things she described as out of the ordinary. Of course, I was pleasantly surprised and intrigued both with the nature of the message and with Silvana's interesting East European accent that I couldn't directly place. I'm usually pretty adept at discerning people's origins from their accents, but because the message contained a sense of urgency tinged with underlying concern or worry, Silvana's linguistic origin was a tough call. Silvana's message had been left on the same day of my haunted library excursion in Salem, and she said that Vincent thought this case was especially suited for the two of us. Even though we had never worked together, Silvana said that I shouldn't be concerned about how she knew Vincent, or me for that matter, or what the case entailed, but that I should call and meet with her as soon as possible. She added that she wasn't worried about the lack of any formal framework within Vincent's organization for paranormal investigations. She said, this is kind of an investigation most people would think is bizarre and possibly crazy, but you know as I do that there are many things that cannot be explained, and there are but a few of us who are more than just curious. We are determined to uncover the unexplained. At first I thought Vincent was playing one of his infamous practical jokes goading me into thinking that he had come around to forming the special unit. So I'd rush into his office, arms flailing and spouting a hundred ideas, and then he'd burst out with the bogus Silvana, laughing hysterically next to him. But the next message on my machine confirmed what Silvana had said. It was Vincent's secretary, Barbara, who was always as serious as deaf and never known to goof around. Barbara said Vincent was out of town, but that I should call Savannah immediately. It is very important, she said. So not knowing who Silvana was or if she existed, and still not convinced that this wasn't a trick of some kind, I instead waited until Vincent returned to town in the next few days. I didn't want some nutty joke overshadowing the real proof I just uncovered and ruining the possibility of realizing X investigations. I visited the offices of Intercontinental Investigations one rainy Tuesday morning with Betsy's borrowed digital camera in hand. I was adamant about convincing Vincent about my paranormal experience so I knew I had to put the evidence right on his desk so he could see it with his own eyes. He greeted me as cordially as usual, before, but before I could say a word, he asked if I had contacted Savannah. When I told him that I had him, he became curiously agitated and said that Savannah had just a case I was looking for to start X investigations. Before he could pick up the phone to call her, I stuck the camera under his nose with a glowing photo and said, Vincent, I'm glad you said that. Now look at these photos. Tell me what you see. 
And so he said, I see you're holding some gadget in an old house with a blob of light reflecting on the picture. And I told him that this was no blob of light, but an actual ghostly orb captured digitally. And he said, come on, this is a picture of a ghost. It's dust on the lens. It took me the better part of an hour of raised eyebrows and Vincent snickering to convince him that orbs are one of the most common paranormal phenomenon photographed. And I described in detail the coldness, the malevolent feelings, and the lurking presence in the dark that both Betsy and I felt. It took some doing, but Vincent knew that if I was this passionate about something, he'd better listen. After an intense accounting of what took place at the Salem Library, Vincent became mesmerized, and by the end of my tale, he was hanging on every word. When I showed him the remainder of the orb photos, he simply said, I've got chills running up and down my spine, but I need more proof. The detective agency often used forensic specialists to investigate and analyze the most obscure evidence and clues and manageable, although I suspected that most of Vincent's experts never did much ghost hunting. So I suggested to him that we have the camera analyzed by one of his associates to validate the legitimacy of the photo and determine whether there was any normal interference, and that may have caused at least the appearance of the orb. If there were dust or reflections on the lens, these could be detected by modern-day super sleuths, and if they didn't find any evidence of this, I was sure that I could convince Vincent and that other, that other worlds existed beyond our own and, more importantly, persuade him to back my fledgling idea to help discover why these worlds exist and why they often intrude on this plane of existence we call reality. It didn't take long for Felix, Vincent's forensic photography expert, to give us the results in the detective's office a few days later. His report stated that from all the data supplied to him, the camera, its digital disc, and its optics, they were all working just fine. He also reported that the digital images taken by Betsy that night were not tampered with in any way. There were no scratches on the camera lens, and there was no discernible dirt or dust. Felix added that any reflection that would have appeared on the photo would not have caused such a porous image, but would rather have appeared solid. He told us that a light reflection would have blurred deeply, and the orb on the photo was nearly transparent. And so the bottom line was that Felix delivered the honest answers I'd hoped to hear. The photos were legitimate, and the orb appearance could not be explained. And so for all intents and purposes, we had caught a ghost on camera. And so feeling vindicated and confident that I could make a go of ex-investigations, I asked Vincent straight out if we could use his office as a headquarters. He still wasn't convinced about the viability of a ghost-busting occult investigations division within his company, but he remembered Savannah and her almost frantic plea to him about a woman in dire need of help, not normal private detective assistance, but something requiring specialized expertise. He told me that I should first speak with Savannah to see what her situation involved. If we could fit it all together, Vincent said he'd back our endeavor. Savannah had given Vincent only a sketchy idea of our would-be maiden case. The most he knew was that it involved a woman on the east side who had a recurring problem with unknown forces and that she was at her wit's end. There was something about her freaking out at a cafe and the owner was threatening to sue her if she didn't stop harassing his cafe about a curse or some nonsense, Vincent told me. I knew that there was something Vincent was reluctant to tell me. That was his style. Tease a case so the investigator got interested enough to flesh out the details and eventually get so absorbed in the investigation that it became an obsession. But he didn't have to play games to get me involved with this case. I figured that any case that would launch X-Investigations was worth pursuing. I wasted no time and called Savannah that evening at her home. What she told me not only piqued my curiosity, but allowed me a peek at a world only a few would dare visit. She answered the phone with a distinct Czech accent, saying hello. I began to introduce myself by saying I am, and then she cut me off mid-sentence and said, I know who you are, Mr. Johnson. You have waited too long to contact me. We must act quickly, for there is a woman's life at stake. Before I could ask her how she knew it was me, she said that she was a clairvoyant and medium with psychic abilities, and if I needed proof, she said I was to meet with her that very evening. 
If you were psychic, I said, then you should know where I'm thinking about meeting right now. And so I waited for an answer, but the phone line was dead. And so, but weird, I thought. But then my apartment buzzer rang and the doorman said I had a message left downstairs that said the meeting that evening concerning the woman in need was to be at my favorite coffee house, Manzo's in Little Italy. I asked the doorman who left the message and he said all that he could remember was that she was a quote unquote tall babe with a great body and an accent. He couldn't remember her name. But he said she was worth going to the meeting for no matter where it was, even if it was pouring an icy November rain outdoors. As I got out of the cab on Kenmare Street in front of Manzo's to meet the mysterious Silvana, I gathered my umbrella and immediately had a sensation that I was about to see an old friend, not a new acquaintance. Maybe it was wishful thinking or a carryover sense of familiarity from our phone conversation, but when I entered the cafe and saw Silvana sipping an espresso and dressed in a black turtleneck sweater, black leather skirt, and deep violet tights with Sex in the City designer pointed half boots, I felt as though I was about to reconnect with an old relative or an old flame. It didn't hurt that she was stunningly beautiful. Tall, slender, with dark eyes and dark hair, she was a bit of a beatnik combined with some of the Avengers Emma Peel TV character thrown in. But my first impression of her as a sophisticated European was mixed with the feeling that Silvana harbored some dark secrets. I felt that she was troubled, not by mundane problems, but by something that could be described as inky, murky, almost ancient. Silvana stood tall and straight when she saw me enter. She greeted me with a firm handshake and warm but questioning eyes. In her Czech accent, she said it was a pleasure to meet me, but then she got right down to business. She told me of a woman who was cursed, not by a person, but by a store, a cafe right here in Manhattan. Mary Montrose had contacted her some weeks before after learning of Silvana's psychic abilities. With no one else to turn to, Mary had sought Savannah's help in ridding herself of the awful occurrences that haunted her daily life. They were strange indeed. The fits of hysteria, the cold winds in her room, the smell of vomit in her kitchen, and the constant disappearance of her money. Mary's life was becoming a nightmare, and as Savannah recounted Mary's story to me for the better part of two hours, I finally realized what was behind Savannah's questioning eyes. She could feel the other side and the entities that inhabit it, but she could do nothing about it. She was virtually paralyzed by her own perceptive powers. Savannah was a paranormal conduit who needed help from someone who could stay grounded on this plane, and that's where I came in. The next morning in Vincent's Midtown offices over, do over deli bagel and coffee, I explained to Silvana my idea to start ex-investigations and how her calling me and seeking help with Mary Montrose was serendipitous to say the least. She wasn't very concerned with the business of solving occult cases. Savannah's more burning issue was to fulfill her calling. But she agreed that having a framework for this kind of assistance was a good idea. When I asked her if she was interested in becoming my partner and that she could have to undergo some kind of paranormal abilities testing, she simply smiled at me and told me the exact date that my mother passed away, that my father was still alive, and what hospital I was born in in Brooklyn. I told her that was a pretty good party game psychism, but any good detective could have simply looked up those records on the internet. But when she told me that my old cat Sanser liked to eat lasagna, I was stunned. Now, how did you know that? I asked. And then she said, Vincent told me. I gave Savannah the benefit of the doubt and we became paranormal partners on the spot. And so we began mapping out ex-investigations as a business with a plan to call Mary Montrose that afternoon and get that case underway. We didn't know what our fees would be or what equipment and or professionals we would need to conduct during our investigations, but we knew we had an enigma on our hands. Silvana didn't know or did know, however, that Mary appeared to be well off financially and she even mentioned that money was no object. Savannah pointed out that Mary wore an expensive initial M diamond brooch. Robert, she refused to call me Bob. It must have cost three or two or three hundred thousand dollars, Savannah said. At the very least, we could tell Vincent that we were not working for free. 
I asked Savannah to tell me in detail about Mary's bizarre dilemma, and the more she relayed, the more I felt this would be more than just our first case. It would be an adventure into the unknown. I can't explain why. I just knew we were embarking on a fantastic experience, one that would haunt us for days to come. Mary Montrose answered her telephone in a strained tone. Hello, Miss Montrose. This is Bob Johnson. I'm an associate of Silvana's. And at that point, Mary interrupted me and said that she was terribly troubled. Yes, I know who you are. Can you help me? Do you know what I've been going through these past few weeks? She was frantically rambling, so I had to stop her by asking for her address and when we could visit her. I asked if we could perhaps meet at the Velvet Room Cafe, the origin of her troubles, but she snapped back that that was the last place she wanted to meet right now. The last time I was in the cafe, I was taken away in an ambulance and spent two days in a psychiatric ward at St. Vincent's Hospital. And so please come to my home. And so Savannah and I arrived at Mary's apartment around 7 that evening. The weather had gotten progressively worse, now mixing sleet and snowflakes with the icy rain, so we were happy to enter the warm lobby of Mary's luxury apartment building. The traditionally cozy Mediterranean decor, the fire in the lobby fireplace, and the hospitable concierge gave us a sense of security on entering, but the glow soon vanished when we heard Mary's unsettling ghost story. The well-dressed middle-aged woman served us tea and specialty chocolate cookies that I recognized from an expensive Upper East Side food boutique. All indications were that Mary was a product of fine upbringing and was no stranger to the better things in life. But despite the graciousness of the moment, Mary sighed deeply and began telling us how she was literally thrown into the Velvet Room Cafe by virtue of an errant taxi cab that jumped a curb nearly killing her. It was the strangest thing. I was shopping and a bit tired, so I thought I could have some coffee at a small, lovely cafe I had spotted many times before, but never had the time to visit. I really could not remember where it was located, but I recalled it was lavishly decorated in Victorian fashion, so I just started to wander along Madison Avenue. Suddenly, I heard screeching, and the next thing I knew, I was laying near the cafe with people rushing around, asking me if I was all right and if I needed a doctor. Well, once I gathered my senses, I was pleased to discover that I had at least reached the destination I sought, so I accepted the shop owner's gracious offer of tea and scones gratis for my trouble, she recounted. She then explained how she admired the Velvet Room Cafe's decor, the beautiful and lush drapery, the ornate wallpaper, and the gilded furniture. As she sipped her tea, Mary was pleased with the sense of warmth that she got from the cafe and decided she would visit as often as she could. And then the unexplained began to happen. As Mary was nibbling on her blueberry scone, she felt a tightening in her throat. At first, she thought that maybe she was allergic to some ingredient in the pastry, but she had eaten blueberry scones many times before. They were her favorite. She was puzzled by what was causing this sensation, and then things got worse. The strangling feeling increased, and all at once, the walls of the room seemed to be closing in on her. What was this odd feeling? Of, was, the, was it a delayed reaction to the near accident, she wondered? She couldn't think straight. She told Savannah and me that it hadn't felt like an ordinary illness, but rather that something that crept into her throat and was choking her from the inside. And so the walls of the cafe moved towards Mary in an ominous, threatening manner. So powerfully, it caused her to drop the scone and shriek, freezing the patrons and cafe workers in their very footsteps. She could barely speak as she told us of her horrifying experience, but I insisted that she continue, telling us in as much detail as possible so we could get a handle on what we were dealing with. I instructed Savannah to begin tape recording when we entered the apartment, so everything Mary said was documented. Of course, Mary, this could have been an aftershock, so to speak, from your trauma that day, as you already mentioned, I said. But Mary told us she had a medical checkup the very next day that suggested nothing abnormal. More important, the cafe incident was just the first in a series of harrowing experiences that followed her home. They are not all physical manifestations of that trauma, she said. Things are happening in this apartment that have nothing to do with me physically. I feel as though I was being watched, taunted, and punished 
for something. I am being hunted, she said, choking back tears. In fact, this will probably be a good point to um, stop it here, at least with regards to this chapter, and then continue the final part of the chapter afterward in my next video. So let's go ahead and let's briefly talk about that here. First off, Bob Johnson's excitement at the orbs. Uh, that's very true. I remember when I was first starting ghost hunting about maybe uh, four or five years ago, I too got some orbs captured and it was really, really exciting. They are the easiest to capture. Eventually, you start to realize and discern what is dust, what are insects, and then what are truly orbs. And I will admit, probably at the beginning, I probably considered some other things that weren't orbs as orbs, just, you know, the gist of things and being so excited. But afterward, there is truly some proof. And I've shown it in some of my past videos already on the ghost and spirit side. In fact, there's one that I titled something along the lines of best evidence I've ever had, and it showcases orbs. So this is the real deal. In fact, just the other week, I was over there in Pioneer Village, and once again, I captured some orbs there. Interesting, too, about the meeting with Bob and then also Silvana. She's a clairvoyance and was able to get him uh, intrigued with the idea of investigating things about Mary, showcasing proof to him about uh, being able to be somebody that not is a Ryan, not necessarily a mind reader, but is someone that is able to um, have that ability, some kind of ability to be able to discern information that a clairvoyant would. I'm glad that was mentioned too because there were, I would be thinking of some red flags as well. In fact, that book. Through the Mystic Glass by Dr. David Marsh was also highlighting how there's so much, for lack of a better term, fraud associated with um, that type of business. The idea that people come to people for help and those people that offer these services to them involving removal of curses or something else, how it's all become a big scam. But in this case, with Silvana, it definitely seems like she's the real deal and she was able to convince Bob Johnson right away. And then finally, we get a little bit more detail about what's happening to Mary. Who knew that having just this one single occurrence, a visit within that cafe, and it's leading to more strange, almost threatening things occurring to her, not just while she was there, but afterward. So it'll be great to be able to go into the next part of the chapter and then finalize it there and then see what happened with Mary's experience. But let me know what you guys think. Please post those comments below. All right, everybody. Thanks again as always. Take care. Bye.